these tanks are, of course, much more sophisticated than those tanks the German army and the Soviet army had 40 years ago. And today, all our forces in Central Europe are fully mechanized forces. But in those days, we had only about 10% Panzer, tank, or mechanized forces on those sides. And still, these 10% bore the brunt of the battle. Their tactics were decisive for the outcome of many operations, especially the defensive operations. And therefore, I think, even 40 years later, it is quite appropriate to study not only the theoretical doctrinal uh, principles of those tactics, but also the skills, the practical skills of commanders and troops, of those commanders and troops who stem for more than four years the tide of this uh, numerically vastly superior enemy. <laughs> The German army, which inflicted lightning defeats on Poland in September 1939 and Western Europe in June 1940, was spearheaded by panzer forces which had been in existence for only four years. The Versailles Treaty of 1919 had prohibited the development of modern offensive weapons by Germany after World War I, and so the first three panzer divisions formed in 1935 were disguised as motor demonstration commands and the first tank as a light agricultural tractor. This did not prevent far-sighted officers, such as Colonel Heinz Guderian, from studying the writings of leading British exponents of armoured warfare, Fuller and Little Hart. He used armoured cars, motorcycles, anti-tank guns and dummy tanks in exercises which may have looked primitive but were vital in developing command and control techniques, particularly radio. The first three models of German tanks were all lightly armed and lightly armored. However, the Panzer IV weighed 18 tons and had a top speed of 35 kilometers per hour. Its gun was the somewhat inaccurate short barrel 75 millimeter. Despite its shortcomings, it became the standard tank of the German army and remained in production until the end of the Second World War. While the Germans were experimenting with dummy tanks, the Soviets had already begun creating powerful armored forces. By 1932, Soviet industry was turning out 3,000 armored fighting vehicles per month. By 1935, the Red Army already possessed four mechanized corps, each with one rifle and two tank divisions. However, Soviet armor made a poor showing in the Spanish Civil War and it was decided to disband the unwieldy tank corps. The winter war against Finland was another disaster and gave the Germans an exaggerated view of the Red Army's incompetence. Before the tank corps could be completely disbanded, they were given a reprieve. In June 1940, German panzer formations cut a swathe across Western Europe and even the powerful French army and British expeditionary force could not halt them. In July 1940, in response to the German victories, the Red Army ordered the formation of 29 tank corps, each with a thousand or more tanks. However, not a single one of these new tank corps had completed its formation by the time the Germans struck. For example, the 14th Tank Corps of the Western Military District, formed in March 1941 with an establishment of 1,023 tanks, including the new heavy KV and medium T-34, could only field 508 tanks, most of which were worn out T-26s. In June 1941, the Soviet Union had about 5 million men under arms. 3 million of these were to be found in the 170 formations and supporting units deployed in the west of the country. The Air Force, 
which was not a separate arm, had 1,500 modern planes and thousands of obsolete ones. Soviet Russia's western borders ran 4,500 kilometers from the Barents Sea in the north to the Black Sea in the south. The 3,375 kilometers of land frontier was defended by 56 divisions to a depth of about 50 kilometers. The second echelon, containing most of the tank formations, was to be found anywhere from 50 to 100 kilometers behind the frontier. The reserves, which also included a number of mechanized corps, were deployed from 150 to 400 kilometers from the frontier. At the outbreak of World War II in September 1939, the German army had 70 active divisions, of which 13 were classified as motorized and five as panzer divisions. A typical panzer division had a panzer brigade with two panzer regiments, each with two panzer battalions, each with four companies of light tanks, and a motorized infantry brigade with one rifle regiment with a motorcycle battalion and three infantry battalions. In 1940, the number of panzer divisions was doubled, but the tank strength of each was halved by reducing the number of light and medium tanks and replacing them by fewer, heavier models with increased firepower. The infantry component was increased, and this made a more balanced formation. Before dawn on the 22nd of June, 1941, 152 German divisions, including 19 Panzer and 14 motorized divisions, and 29 satellite divisions, totaling some five and a half million men, invaded the Soviet Union. This huge force was divided into three army groups, spearheaded by the Panzer divisions. Army Group North, von Leib, was to advance northeastwards to Leningrad, while its northern flank was to trap Soviet forces with their backs to the Baltic Sea. Army Group Center, von Bock, was to take the most direct route from Brest-Litovsk to Smolensk over the river Dnieper, and either north to Leningrad or straight on to Moscow, a distance, as the crow flies, of 1,000 kilometers. Army Group South, von Rundstedt, was to advance with its 600 tanks on Kiev and the Dnieper Valley and destroy all Soviet forces between the Pripech marshes and the Black Sea. The artillery bombardment started at 0400 hours, and at about 0600 or 0700 hours, we crossed the bridge which had been taken by the infantry. There were a few lights of your tanks, amphibious tanks, but they presented no problem to us. We pressed on fairly quickly in the direction of Berdichev, which was the objective of our attack. And we had hardly any sleep since we drove right through both day and night with Luftwaffe support until we encountered the first T-34s in front of Berdichev. My thoughts on crossing the Russian frontier were as follows. We were a very old, experienced panzer division which had fought in Poland and France and uh, we felt superior to any opponent. The Russians were no real match for us. This impression changed quickly on the very first day. We crossed the frontier at Taurage, and there we encountered Russian frontier troops who fought so hard but by noon on the first day, we had expended all the ammunition in the Panzer Fall. In the first days of war, German forces were advancing very swiftly, and this put the entire staff of the Red Army in a state of shock, as it were. This state of shock stayed with us for quite a long time. As far as I know, the Soviets weren't organized to fight until July or even the beginning of August. This was in the region of Staraya Russa, to the west of Novgorod. But before that, let's say in July, 
the Soviet army was retreating in such chaos that reconnaissance of the Northwestern Front had to send special detachment to find out not where the enemy was positioned, but where the Soviet units, their own army was. Air superiority was another decisive factor. By midday on the 22nd of June 1941, the Luftwaffe had attacked 66 airfields and destroyed some 800 aircraft on the ground. Thereafter, the Germans enjoyed almost complete air superiority. As the armored spearheads penetrated deeper into Soviet territory, they began to experience not only increasingly bitter resistance, but the other problems of waging war in Russia. Vast distances, heat, dust, exhaustion, and wear and tear on vehicles and equipment. In many ways, the Soviet Union was an ideal country for armored warfare. But the enormous distances lowered the morale of the infantrymen who had to march most of the way, so that the foot soldier often went into battle already exhausted. Russia had many roads, but only one metalled highway from Brest-Litovsk to Moscow. The other roads were little more than tracks. The wooden bridges, which crossed the many streams and rivers, were often too weak to take the weight of heavy military traffic. The Soviet railway system left much to be desired. Since the tracks were a wider gauge, every kilometer of line had to be narrowed. The few railheads assumed considerable strategic and tactical importance. Once supplies had been offloaded, they might then have to be transported as much as 500 kilometers by road to the front. By the autumn of 1941, the Red Army had suffered a series of shattering defeats and encirclements, and its losses in material and men were astronomical. The morale of the troops was so low that at the beginning of the war, some Soviet divisions and even some armies encircled by the Germans didn't even try to fight back, but gave themselves up. Never before in the whole history of Russia had anyone seen full-blooded, fully armed divisions or corps surrender without a shot being fired. At this critical phase of the operation, when the Germans had reached the line Leningrad, Smolensk, Kiev, there was a conflict of opinion. Hitler became increasingly concerned with the economic and political objectives, such as the far-off Caucasian oil fields and the Ukrainian corn fields. The field commanders insisted that the first priority must be the destruction of the Red Army. The generals, particularly Guderian, wanted to press on to Moscow, but three vital weeks passed before Hitler finally decided on the Ukraine. The Panzer forces were redeployed in the Ukraine, and Army Group South, reinforced by Guderian's tanks, advanced into the Crimea. The offensive against Moscow was finally resumed on the 30th of September, 1941. The sudden switch took the Soviets by surprise, and soon huge Red Army forces found themselves encircled at Bryansk and Vyazma. When, on the 16th of October, these pockets surrendered, Army Group Center had taken one and a half million prisoners since the beginning of the campaign. The way to Moscow appeared to be wide open, but when the first ominous fall of snow suddenly melted, the roads dissolved into a quagmire, and the German advance was reduced to an average of 12 kilometers a day. This was so viel and so tief schlamm, that man, außer mit großen Zugmaschinen, there was so much and such deep mud that only large tractors could move, tanks could move, tractors could move, but no lorries with petrol or ammunition could move forward. Then we had to wait until the ground froze up again. 
and when the frost came, we were off again to Moscow. We pressed on fairly smartly until we came to a road junction north of Moscow, about 25 kilometers from Moscow. And then an icy cold set in, and also very stiff Russian resistance. The cold was so severe that our tanks were practically immobilized. It was quite the coldest Russian winter, with temperatures more than 40 degrees below freezing. And if one considers that at the time we had no winter clothing, things were particularly severe. As far as the vehicles were concerned, we had difficulties in getting them to start in the mornings, and sometimes we had to make fire under the motor, as even with the jump starter, the vehicles couldn't be started otherwise, with everything stuck in the frozen oil. The Germans had fought their way over 900 kilometers, and Moscow was just 30 kilometers away when on the 6th of December, 1941, with temperatures below minus 30 degrees centigrade, the offensive was called off. The Soviet Supreme Command sensed that the Germans had shot their bolt, and with reinforcements arriving from the Far East, the Red Army went on to the offensive. Sad and also astonishing for us was that the Russians, with their T-34s, paid no attention to the cold. The Siberian divisions that came here to Europe just shook themselves and said, how warm, and fought us. And the retreat naturally depressed us even more. For the first time, we felt that we were beaten. In appalling weather, and despite Hitler's categoric order not to give up a single meter of Soviet territory, the Germans were pushed back until they were able to establish a line east of Smolensk, south to the Meuse River. There they remained until operations could be resumed again in the spring. Despite the optimism which continued to prevail in the Führer's headquarters, not one of Hitler's primary objectives had been attained. Leningrad and Moscow had not fallen, while in the south, much of the Ukraine lay beyond Germany's reach. In many ways, the Soviets had contributed to their own defeats during the first months of the campaign. By attempting a linear defense of every kilometer of their vast frontier, they had spread out their forces so that the Germans were always able to achieve overwhelming superiority in the areas of their main effort. By placing their reserves so far back, Rudimentary communications, bad roads, lack of motor transport and inexperienced commanders meant that they were easily outfought by more flexible and mobile German forces. The whole command system of Soviet regiments and divisions is based on the principle of very strict subordination from top to bottom. That extremely strict subordination existed before the war. So the whole of the officer corps was trained to execute very precisely the orders received from above. But just before the war, many senior officers had been liquidated in Stalin's purges, and the newly promoted senior officers were quite unprepared to show initiative. Anyhow, they were not expected to show initiative. On the contrary, it was forbidden by military regulations, which specified that each officer and each man was only to execute the orders of his immediate superior. Initiative was considered risky. Those commanders that survived were mostly Stalin's old favorites, like the Russian Civil War heroes Budyoni, Voroshilov and Timoshenko, who were completely out of their depth when it came to marshalling vast armies in the era of the tank. The Germans had to come to terms with the fact that in the T-34, the Soviets possessed an armored fighting vehicle which was far superior to anything they had. At that time, I was a lance corporal in a Panzer II, which anyway couldn't harm enemy tanks. 
In the Uman pocket, we saw the T-34 for the first time. And understandably, we were astonished to see what kind of tank it was, particularly the quality of its armor and its construction. Consequently, this tank could, in practice, only be knocked out frontally by our 88 mm guns and from the side by our 5 cm or 7.5 cm anti-tank guns. Thus, for example, the 3.7 anti-tank gun was more or less useless. We had to adjust ourselves to the idea that with the anti-tank weapons available to us, the 3.7 and 5 cm tank guns, we could not, in practice, knock out the T-34. Our heavy companies with 7.5 cm guns discovered, mainly by chance, that high explosive shells with a quarter second delayed action fuse, when fired at the rear of the T-34 tank, either set on fire the diesel oil canisters or caused a fire in the engine compartment as a result of fire penetrating the air induction gratings. During the early months of 1942, the Germans formed another four panzer divisions, giving them an actual strength of 3,300 tanks on the Eastern Front in May 1942. Armoured personnel carriers were still in short supply, however, and only one grenadier battalion in each panzer division was equipped with them, despite their new designation of panzer grenadiers. The other battalions continued to travel in lorries. The point of maximum effort of the 1942 German summer offensive was in the Kursk region. Army Group B, with three armies and 4th Panzer Army, was to head for the Don, then swing south along its banks, encircling as many Soviet divisions as it could in the river's great bend between Rostov and Voronezh. The Soviets, expecting the offensive to be resumed against Moscow, were taken by surprise when, on the 28th of June, 1942, 800 tanks and assault guns of 4th Panzer Army broke through their lines in the Ukraine and struck across the rolling plains to the river Don. As always, the Luftwaffe played a key role. It had been ordered to support only the armored spearheads, and an officer in Luftwaffe uniform was often to be found up amongst the leading tanks. One must make a distinction between the so-called Flievo and the Stuka liaison officer or Stuka light officer. The task of the Flievo at core level lay mainly in keeping the Army Corps Command informed about everything that the Air Force was doing, or at least everything that could be of use to the Corps Command in assessing the situation. Whereas the Stuka liaison officer was always at the front, mostly with the armored spearheads. The Stuka liaison officer usually stationed himself in the morning, at daybreak, at the focal point of the operations, with his tank. Behind the tank, an arrow-shaped trench was dug, about one and a half meters deep, and an orange-colored cloth laid in it, so that the dive bombers flying in would recognize both our main fighting line and likewise the enemy target. I remember a very unpleasant situation in which we ran up against a Russian anti-tank barrier consisting of T-34s and anti-tank AA guns and in just the type of terrain where we couldn't get ourselves under cover all that quickly. The air liaison officer, who was in fact in the same dangerous situation as we were, immediately called out the Stukas. And before the battalion could even fully react, the Stukas bombed the edge of the wood where the Russian anti-tank front was located and thereby eliminated the danger we were facing. 
The Panzer Army also had direct control over its reconnaissance flights and used them to seek out Soviet troop movements in plenty of time to plan the most effective countermeasures. Momentum was maintained despite Soviet attempts to strike at 4th Panzer Army's exposed flank as it sped towards Stalingrad on the River Volga with very little resistance when Hitler made a fatal decision. He ordered the 4th to swing south and assist 1st Panzer Army in its crossing of the River Don. On the 23rd of July, the Germans took Rostov, gateway to the Caucasus. When, two weeks later, 4th Panzer Army resumed its advance on Stalingrad, the Soviets had just scraped together sufficient forces to hold the Germans and their allies on the outskirts of the city. The name alone, Stalin City, was enough to ensure its special significance in Hitler's eyes, although the town itself had no strategic importance. By committing the 6th Army to the storming of Stalingrad, Hitler deprived his soldiers of their one advantage, mobility, while pitting them against the inadequately trained but dogged adversary, the Red Army infantrymen. On the 14th of October, 1942, Hitler brought to a close the summer offensive by halting all operations except those on the southern sector in the Caucasus and around Stalingrad. In November 1942, the front line ran from Leningrad in the north to Rzhev, Ariol, and along the river Don to Stalingrad, and then south to the Caucasus Mountains and the Black Sea east of Novorossiysk. However, the Red Army was still in the field and even beginning to grow in strength, whereas the German army in the east was nearing the end of its offensive capabilities. Its losses were approaching the two million mark and the survivors were battle-weary. Vehicles and equipment were in need of maintenance, while the armaments industry was only just able to replace battle losses. For both Hitler and Stalin, the Battle of Stalingrad assumed symbolic significance far in excess of its strategic importance. In purely military terms, the main German objective was to deprive the Soviets of their supply arteries of the rivers Don and Volga. And this could have been done without taking Stalingrad itself. Rather than eliminate Soviet bridgeheads on the west bank of the Volga, above and below Stalingrad, the 6th Army was committed to a battle of attrition in the city's rubble. The Luftwaffe was so committed to the Battle of Stalingrad that the Soviets were able to build up reserves without having to contend with Luftwaffe interference. To prevent German forces exerting additional pressure on the city's defenders, the Soviets resumed activity on 6th Army's flanks during September 1942. Throughout October, the fighting in the city rose in intensity until, by the 20th, the remaining pockets of Soviet resistance had been pushed back to within a thousand meters of the banks of the Volga. But during that critical month, the Soviet high command was planning a counteroffensive, codenamed Oran. It began to assume the shape of a single strategic operation along a 300 kilometer long front involving the Stalingrad, Don, and southwestern fronts each of which was roughly equivalent to a German army group. The southwestern front was to break through the sector of the line held by the Romanians between Serafimovich and Kletskaya and head southeast for Kalach. Three days were allowed for this 100-kilometer advance. The Stalingrad front was to launch its attack from the Sarepta lakes against the Romanian line and converge on Kalach, where it was to link up with the southwestern front, thus cutting off the enemy between the rivers Volga and Don. Its left flank was to attack in the direction of Kotelnikovo. The Don front was to launch simultaneous offensives from its Kletskaya bridgehead and destroy the German forces in the small bend of the Don. The Germans and their allies, strung out along the 400-kilometer-long front on the river Don, were not so much an army group as a group of armies, 
South of Stalingrad was the 4th Romanian Army, while way out in the steppe near Elista was the 16th Panzer Grenadier Division. In and around Stalingrad itself were the 6th Army and 4th Panzer Army. From the city northwards to Kursk were the 3rd Romanian, 8th Italian, 2nd Hungarian and 2nd German armies. In reserve, behind the sector held by the 3rd Romanian Army was the 48th Panzer Corps. Its Panzer divisions were to play the key role in the defensive fighting along the Chian River. Otherwise, there were no significant German reserves and little hope of reinforcements. By November 1942, the Romanian troops on the Don were at the end of a march which had taken them across the Ukraine and Bessarabia to the Black Sea, where for two months they had laid siege to Odessa. During that journey, they had lost 130,000 of their comrades. They were clearly overtaxed by the Russian assault. As far as equipment and training were concerned, they were not in a position to resist a concentrated Russian tank attack. Moreover, behind them there were hardly any reserves, so that the collapse on these fronts could have been forecast. General Karl Adolf Hollit, commander of Army Detachment Hollit, was also well aware of the danger. I remember leaving the main headquarters, the Führer headquarters, with an officer and saying to him, now have a look at this. We are surrounded right and left by foreign soldiers, our allies. There are the Romanians and then the Italians and the Hungarians are beyond the Romanians. They don't all measure up to the German troops. They can't because they haven't got the same experience and above all, they haven't the same armament. And I am telling you, this could conceivably cause difficulties. So I don't trust these allies one little bit. And the officer said to me, don't let the Führer Adolf Hitler hear that. And then I got really cheeky and said, if he doesn't want to hear it, then he will soon feel it. During the first week of November, as the Germans prepared to renew their efforts to take Stalingrad, Soviet forces began to move into their forming up positions for Operation Uran. The marshalling of this tremendous force while the fighting for Stalingrad still raged was in itself an incredible achievement. One and a half million men, 13,500 guns, 894 tanks and 1,115 aircraft. Ferrying men and equipment across the wide Don and Volga rivers and deploying and concealing them in the open steppe was a hazardous operation. Increased Soviet air activity during the infrequent periods of good flying weather reduced German air reconnaissance significantly. On the eve of the Soviet counteroffensive, German and Soviet forces along the 700 km southern sector were roughly equal. But by stripping other formations, the Soviets were able to build up significant superiority, particularly against Germany's ill-equipped allies. Operation Uran began at 0720 on the 19th of November, when the southwestern and Don fronts broke out of their bridgeheads and struck the line weakly held by the Romanian Third Army. Initially, the Soviet rifle divisions, with their weak armored complement, were held by the Romanians. But massed Soviet armor broke through their flanks and drove out into the steppe beyond. Despite appalling weather and poor visibility, both the Stalingrad and southwestern fronts had penetrated deep into 6th Army's eastern flank and were 30 kilometers in the German rear. At 1400 hours on the 23rd of November, troops of the southwestern and Stalingrad fronts linked up at Kalach. This initial encirclement trapped 270,000 German and Allied troops of the 6th Army in the Stalingrad pocket an area 57 kilometers west to east and 35 kilometers north to south. The most important task now for the Soviet southwestern and southern fronts was to strengthen the 160 kilometer long outer encirclement of Stalingrad by building up a strong front 
so that German efforts to relieve Stalingrad from the west and southwest could be held off. Sixth Army's first reaction on being encircled was to break out to the west. But on the 24th of November, Hitler ordered General Paulus to stay put, having been assured by Goering that the Luftwaffe could keep the Sixth Army supplied from the air. On the same day, encouraged by its initial success, Soviet High Command decided to extend Operation Uran and began to plan Operation Saturn. This called for the left wing of the Voronezh Front, with 60% of the entire Soviet armoured forces, to launch an offensive in the direction of Rostov, with the object of cutting off Army Group A in the Caucasus and on the Don. On the 26th of November, Field Marshal von Manstein was appointed commander of a new Army Group Don, which consisted of the remnants of 6th Army, the 4th Panzer Army and the 3rd Romanian Army. His task was to coordinate the defences on the flanks of the 6th Army in Stalingrad. Field Marshal Eric von Manstein was born in Berlin on the 24th of November 1897. He was commissioned into the Prussian Foot Guards in 1906 and during the First World War served on both the Eastern and Western Fronts. Between the wars he held several general staff appointments and in October 1936 was promoted Major General. In July 1942, in recognition of his superb generalship, which had contributed so much to Germany's victories, Hitler promoted him Field Marshal. He was the typical commander of the old school, who, during the First World War, commanded from far in the rear, far removed from the actual events of the fighting and from weather conditions and hardships, but who could nevertheless make the right strategic decisions. In this respect, he differed fundamentally from the more tactical troop commanders such as Model or Rommel or Guderian. But even so, with his outstanding strategic talents, he was one among very few comparable commanders-in-chief and battle arbiters of the Second World War. Chief of the General Staff was General Zeitzler, and his deputy for operations was Lieutenant General Heusinger. For the whole of the Eastern Front, there were only 14 General Staff officers dealing with operational matters. Central to the system of command in the Prussian-German army was the concept of Auftragstaktik, or orders by directive. Ever since I became a soldier, and that was in the summer of 1909, my experience has been that subordinate commanders in our army were trained to look after themselves, to act on their own initiative, and to make their own decisions. This has been my experience throughout my entire military life. And it was also taken to heart in the First World War. And it paid off. In particular the point about subordinates using their initiative, which was put into practice and used in the training of the Reichswehr, our army at that time under Colonel General von Seegt. The objective of every military operation is the destruction of the adversary. As this can be changed by conducting the fighting in various ways according to a particular situation, the senior commanders, that is to say the divisional commanders and above, must be let free to choose the method of fighting. They received a directive, and this was known as Auftragstaktik. Commanders of companies, battalions and regiments in general received orders which usually went into detail. Since the beginning of the war, formation commanders often led from the front and took important decisions on the spot. They were usually found forward where the major effort was being made. When the commander was with the troops, as was normal almost every day, the chief of staff had to maintain contact over the combat area, both with the divisions under corps command and with the senior army headquarters above him. But as has already been said, if decisions were necessary because of the changing situation, the chief of staff also had to be able to deal with changes in the steps taken by the corps, 
and had to give the corresponding orders to the divisions by telephone. Flexible command, which encouraged initiative, and a highly developed tactical communications net, were in stark contrast to the rigid textbook approach of the Soviets. It was not easy to command armor flexibly when tank commanders had to rely on visual signaling to convey their orders. If von Manstein was to attempt to relieve the encircled Sixth Army, it was essential that his forces remain as close to Stalingrad as possible. And so throughout December, the Soviets exerted enormous pressure on the German and Allied forces between the rivers Don and Chir in their efforts to extend the outer ring as far to the west as possible. The Chir line was held by makeshift units composed of remnants of the 3rd Romanian Army, German infantry, ad hoc alarm units made up of rear service personnel and Luftwaffe field divisions. These divisions were created by Goering from surplus Air Force personnel. They were well equipped but lacked training and were commanded by officers with no experience of ground combat. On the 2nd of December 1942, 48th Panzer Corps ordered its infantry to form a defensive line along the Chia by constructing strong points in depth, not linear. The strong points for all round defense were to be manned by at least a platoon. Individual soldiers were to be deployed between the strong points to prevent Soviet infiltration. Heavy weapons, which included the 88 mm guns, were to be dug in and covered and alternative positions were to be prepared for them. The Corps headquarters reminded its subordinate commanders of their responsibility to ensure that they established contact with their next highest headquarters. Units were to report in every two hours at least, even when all was quiet, because situation unchanged signals were also helpful to Corps headquarters to build up an overall picture of what was happening. The ensuing battle, which developed around the state collective farm, Sofros 79, is a classic example of the superiority of flexible German battle tactics, which time and time again enabled small numbers of well-trained, experienced and well-commanded troops to defeat Soviet forces, which outnumbered them between four and eight times. At the beginning of December 1942, the headquarters of 48th Panzer Corps was at Nizhnyi Chir, where the Chia River runs into the Don. Since it was the nearest point to troops of the 6th Army in Stalingrad, it was a vital bridgehead for 4th Panzer Army's attempt to relieve Stalingrad. Elsewhere along the Chia, the 336th Infantry Division was holding the line from Nizhnyi Chia to Sorovkino. At the beginning of December, 5th Tank Army began to launch a series of heavy attacks across the Chia in an attempt to drive the Germans as far away from Stalingrad as possible. On the 7th of December 1942, 11th Panzer Division with 46 tanks was moving up from Rostov. It was then ordered to halt the Soviet 1st Tank Corps, which had crossed the Chia between Oblivskaya and Surovkino on the left flank of 336th Infantry Division and had advanced to and taken State Collective Farm No. 79. After a night march, the 11th Panzer Division's commander, General Balk, using his anti-aircraft guns as anti-tank artillery, placed them south of the farm. The artillery of 336th Infantry Division was to operate on the Panzer Division's northeast flank. Fifteenth Panzer and 111th Panzer Grenadier regiments advanced undetected along the heights west and north of the farm, while 110th Panzer Grenadier regiment delivered a holding attack. The Panzers hit the rear of the Soviet tank formations and their supply columns just as they were about to attack the rear of 336th Infantry Division. By the end of the battle, the Soviet First Tank Corps had been virtually wiped out with a loss of 50 tanks. German losses were negligible. On the evening of the 11th of December, other Soviet forces broke through the Chia line at Lisinski and Nizhny Kalinovsky, which were about 22 kilometers apart. Fourth Panzer Army began its attempt to break through to Stalingrad on the 12th of December. <laughs> 
Simultaneously, 11th Panzer Division smashed the Soviet breakthrough at Lysinsky and then marched northwest and struck the Soviet forces at Nizhny Kalinovsky and compressed the bridgehead. On the 14th, after a short lull, 11th Panzer Division slipped quietly away from its positions containing the Nizhny Kalinovsky bridgehead and moved to Nizhny Chir, where it was to force a passage over the half-frozen Don to join the left flank of 4th Panzer Army, which was approaching the river Aksai. By the 16th, 4th Panzer Army had fought its way to the Aksai, only 64 kilometers from the nearest troops of the encircled 6th Army. This offensive, launched on the 12th of December, led the Soviets to reconsider their planned major counteroffensive called Saturn, aimed at Rostov, and to launch Little Saturn, which called for the southwestern front to swing the main axis of its attack from the south to the southeast, and so disrupt the German lines of communication concentrated in the Morozovsk area. Powerful armoured forces of the southwestern front crossed the Chir at Ostrovsky and, swinging round to the southeast, headed for Morozovsk. Simultaneously, the Voronezh front swept away the 8th Italian army on the Middle Don and sped southwards. On the 17th of December, just as 11th Panzer Division was about to cross the Don, reports came in of a Soviet breakthrough in 336th Infantry Division sector, nine kilometers north of Nizhny Chir. Instead of joining 4th Panzer Army, 11th Panzer Division was committed to eliminating this bridgehead. But while engaged in that task, the dormant bridgehead at Nizhny Kalinovsky suddenly burst into life and presented another dire threat, and the weary division, the only mobile reserve left, set out on another 19-kilometer night march. At 0500 hours on the 19th of December, Panzer Regiment 15 of 11th Panzer Division, with 25 tanks, surprised a Soviet tank force just as it was about to move off. While 110th Panzer Grenadier Regiment blocked its advance, 15th Panzer Regiment fell in behind the Soviet tanks and in a few minutes knocked out 42 vehicles before their crews realized what was happening. Quite simply, we always had the edge on them, since the Russian army was so very badly led. We gained the impression that no one knew what the other fellow was up to, or what he was supposed to be doing himself. They were just individual tanks milling around. So the secret was to gain as much ground as you could, just as fast as you could, so that the Russians didn't know where they were, or didn't know where our leading tank spearheads were either. The Panzer Regiment's right flank was guarded by 111th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, which also acted as a reserve force. From high ground, Panzer Regiment 15 spotted another Soviet column moving south and fell in behind it, forming a second echelon. In a few minutes, another 20 tanks were destroyed, making the day's total 65. The back of the Soviet attack was broken, and the shattered remnants fled in a northwesterly direction. Uh, our communication system also played a role in our successes. At that time, the communication system was so good among the German troops that, without saying who we were by name, we could tell from the voice who was speaking. Of course, this is all part and parcel of the value of getting to know one another. Our communications were comprehensive in scale, they functioned splendidly, and they were so good in their own way that we were able to talk to one another as if we were all sitting around one table during a battle. Although Operations Uran and Little Saturn had failed to achieve all their objectives, the Red Army had inflicted grievous wounds on the Germans and their allies on the Eastern Front. No amount of individual heroism and self-sacrifice could now help the Germans overcome the power and growing confidence of the Red Army. The Soviet Union is a vast country, so the Soviet Army had plenty of room in which to maneuver. It could retreat for thousands of kilometers to regroup, concentrate its forces, restore the morale of the men, receive land lease aid from its allies, and return to the attack, a strategic counter-offensive. So the very size of the Soviet Union meant that in spite of great losses, in spite of the fact 
that a large part of European USSR had been abandoned to the German occupying forces, the Soviet High Command could concentrate its forces, bringing in units from the Far East and from Siberia to muster them beyond the Volga and then launch the great counterattack which ended in the victory of the Soviet Union.